Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Mark Bergstrom. I'm chair of the Ad Hoc Community Oversight Board Study Committee, and uh, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's uh, public meeting. Um, as you may have noted, we, we have had this meeting scheduled for a while, but the, uh, the nature of the meeting has changed a little bit. We were hoping to provide recommendations tonight before taking them to Borough Council, but the committee has received a one month extension. And so tonight we uh, hope to provide an update of some of the activities and, and some of the issues we've, uh, we've uh, sort of gathered or collected, and then to, uh, to seek any kind of common input uh, regarding any of the work we're doing or what we're planning to do in the future. So I'll talk about that in a little more detail in a minute. But first, I'd like to um, have each of the members of our, our committee introduce themselves. So um, we'll start with Susan. Hi, I'm Susan Bardo. Uh, in my work life, I direct the Family Law Clinic at Penn State Law. Um, I also sit on the Civil Service Commission and the Historic or, um, Human Relations Commissions here in State College Borough. I'm a resident of State College and the Holmes Foster neighborhood. And I'm Mark Bergstrom. I'm um, Executive Director of the Pennsylvania Commission on Sentencing and an Associate Research uh, or Associate Teaching Professor at Penn State in Criminology. And I'm uh, Chair of this committee and Chair of the Civil Service Commission. Um, Jason? Hi everybody, my name is uh, Jason Brown. I am um, on the Three Dots board of Three Dots Downtown. I'm also on a local radio station, uh, heavily involved in the community and Rotary and um, looking forward to hearing all of your thoughts here today to help us inform the direction which we need to go in. Thanks, Jason. I don't believe Barbara's with us uh, yet, but if she joins, we'll have her introduce herself in a minute. Um, Janet? Yes, hi, my name is Janet Irons. I'm a resident of the borough. I uh, taught at Lockheed University for 32 years. I've taught criminal justice history and uh, I'm also involved in the prison society here in Center County and in a lot of the racial justice uh, uh, organizations. Thanks, Janet. Nalani? Hi, uh, I'm Nalini Krishnan Kuti and I'm a, a resident of State College Borough. Uh, I'm a Penn State engineering alum, and I um, write, speak, and uh, um, do a lot of uh, workshops on focusing, um, shaping narratives about immigrants. Uh, I am involved locally in many organizations, including the Board of State Literacy Council, and I uh, serve on Governor Wolf's Advisory Commission on Asian Pacific American Affairs. Thank you. James? Good evening, everyone. Everyone, Sorry about that. James Locker here, uh, currently a resident of Bowlesburg, uh, Harris Township. I first came to State College in 19, 1972 and actually was living here in Bowlesburg for the fir my first six or eight months here and then moved into State College. And then in 1998, my wife and I moved back here to Bowlesburg. I began working for Penn State in 1972 and for my last 30 years at the university, I was the Equal Employment Opportunity Officer for Penn State Cooperative Extension and the College of Ag Sciences. I also serve as a member of the uh, State College Police Civil Service Commission and have been a member for about 35 years. Thanks, Jim. You're uh, welcome. Dan? Good evening. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dan McKenrick. I'm an attorney uh, that works for Penn State Student Legal Services and representing students in a variety of civil and criminal matters in the, in the State College and Center County area. Um, I also serve on the Center Helps Board here locally in State College, um, and I'm really excited to, to hear all the input from the community. So thank you for attending. Thanks, Dan. Uh, I don't believe Shope is with us now, but she plans to join us a little late, later. So if, um, if and when Barbara and Shoba join us, uh, we'll make sure uh, they have an opportunity to introduce themselves. So we'll move to the next slide, which provides um, some information on the, uh, the mandate that the, um, that the study committee has. So we were formed a couple months ago um, with, a, with a, a, a responsibility of identifying models um, for consideration by borough council of community oversight boards. And in the research, you'll find that there are three typical models that are di discussed, a review focused model, 
an investigation focused model and an audit and monitoring type model or focused model. Uh, but there are also any kind of combinations of those uh, that are generally referred to as, as hybrid models. And the committee has been looking at these and trying to understand what's involved in each of these. And um, the committee held an earlier, uh, two earlier public meetings where we were trying to identify uh, some of the um, goals and roles that, that the community thought might be uh, necessary for a state college community oversight board. And we'll get to, to that in a minute, but the whole purpose of that was to help us think about which of these models would best fit. So um, our responsibility, in addition to identifying a model, is then to identify some of the framework around that model, some of the responsibilities or, or attributes of that model. And so the, uh, the mandate that we have, the resolution, uh, talks about us identifying the scope of oversight, the authority and power of that community oversight board, the membership of the board, and membership can include a lot of different uh, matters in terms of who is selected and what the requirements are, what the um, other kind of term of office, other things like that. So it's a pretty detailed area. Uh, staffing and administrative support, if there's going to be paid staff, what does that look like? What are the responsibilities? What's the budget? for um, a community oversight board. And then the duties, responsibilities, and limitations, any legal considerations and reporting uh, issues. So that is what um, we're required to uh, include in our recommendation to borough council. And because of the delay, our recommendation will be made uh, in December, December 7th at borough council meeting. And because of that, we will have one more public meeting sometime between now and then, about midpoint between now and then. Next slide, please. So during the um, earlier meetings, the, the two public meetings, we asked for comments on possible goals and roles for a community oversight board. And in addition to uh, reviewing all of the comment received, both, both uh, comments made during the meetings, but also chat and, and other documents submitted, we also looked at uh, what other community organizations had been talking about or recommending. So we did a review of that to identify those kind of suggestions or recommendations that might impact on, it, on a community oversight board. Uh, we had a chance to meet with uh, some members of the State College Police Department to talk about what they see as positives and negatives and, and things that could be included or should be considered as part of a COB. Uh, and then we had the, the, the great benefit of meeting with Pennsylvania's two existing community oversight boards one from Philadelphia, one from Pittsburgh. And so we, we heard a lot about their experiences, what they were um, asked to do initially, some roadblocks they ran into, and sort of where, where, they stand, where they stand now. And I think at least from my takeaway from those discussions, we heard that there's a real value for a community oversight board, but, but clearly the board has to be linked to that community, the needs of that community and responsive to that community. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to understand those kind of things and make sure that's part of whatever we recommend to borough council. But, but based on those earlier hearings or meetings that we had, um, we did receive, um, I think, some, some feedback in terms of categories of responsibilities that might make sense for a state college community oversight board. These aren't necessarily in, in the order that we heard, um, but, but one, of the, one of the issues that was suggested was um, oversight, an oversight role. The, how much oversight, the, the level of oversight, the involvement um, it, it is not, we have not decided yet, but certainly there was a lot of interest in there being an oversight function that might be um, you know, focused on, on assuring civil rights. Um, thorough and fair investigation, accessible complaint process, and police conduct. Um, we heard about promoting um, communication and transparency, um, a review of departmental policies and procedures, uh, supporting diversity in the department, both in recruitment and retention of officers, um, collaborating on education and training opportunities, both within the department, but also with the community. And also um, working on, on efforts to track outcomes and performance measures so that we can measure 
uh, where things are now, have a baseline, and also uh, try to improve on that and keep track of that. So those are at least some of the goals and roles that we heard about the first round. And so we're now opening it to the public for, um, for comments. And I'll ask um, Douglas to sort of lead us through this as he did the last time. But um, feel free to comment on any of those goals or roles um, to amplify or refine or discuss any of those. Or since we are gonna be thinking about models to adopt, feel free to talk about anything that you think is important for the committee to think about as we start looking into models that might be well suited to St. College. And so with that, let me turn it over to um, Douglas to talk through how, uh, how uh, individuals in the community can provide input and, uh, and then we'll get underway. Thank you, Mark, and uh, uh, thank you, committee members, for all the work you, you're uh, doing towards this topic, and uh, thank you for all the attendees that have taken time out of their evenings to come and offer their opinions. Uh, tonight, uh, just like the previous meeting, if you're part of, uh, please utilize the raise hand feature, um, and uh, to be recognized to speak, each speaker will have four minutes to speak. Uh, uh, if we can get through everyone, we can always do a second round of comments from the speakers in case they run out of time. Um, and then any additional comments that you may have, please, you can either put them in the chat, the chat right now, and those will be, that chat will be saved and uh, presented to all the committee members. Or if you want to digest some of the information and some of the conversations that we're going around here and email us at a, at a later time, you can do that at engage at statecollegepa.us. And that's on our screen now, uh, on our screen now. Uh, if anyone would like to be recognized to speak, please raise your hands. Chris? Okay, thank you. I guess somebody has to break the ice. Uh, <laughs> first off, as a community member of Bullsburg, uh, I want to thank the group for taking their time to do this, and thank you for letting me know how much time I have left. <laughs> With that said, uh, um, one of the things that struck me is uh, our police morale, and uh, I was glad to see that as far as uh, education goes, you did stick in there both police and the community. Uh, but the police morale, um, your whole program kicked off to me on a little bit of a sour note when Barrow Council insisted that it be funded from the police budget, which smacks to me of th that horrible word defund the police, which nobody in in, in our community wants to see a degradation of services. And that word invokes that. Um, I certainly feel that uh, the funding sources could have come out from other channels without hitting the budget of our police department. Um, uh, I, the words are powerful. And I, I, would, I wish to God that the program would have come out and uh, across the country and instead of defund, reallocate is a much better word to be used in looking at this. So services can be moved off the sh shoulders of the police department, but in the same light, an investment with our police and actually refund that money back in so that you can increase the base pay of our police officers uh, to live in this community. This is an expensive community to live in. And the, the heartening thing to me is I train at Victory Sports and Wednesdays are uh, uh, deputy sheriffs from the, the Penn State campus trained there as well. And it's an incredibly diverse young group of people, males, females, all races pretty much represented. So the pool is there. We need to attract them to stay in the community. And uh, uh, I, I just hate that word defund. I would strongly suggest a, a more favorable word such as reallocate. Uh, transparency is, like I said, a two-way street. And uh, I would suggest to the committee that when you launch this program, maybe have a community day, call it First Responders Day and interact with, uh, uh, with the police and other first responders and fully flesh out this program. The community needs to be educated in some of the challenges that our police department have. I just had a conversation today with a very intelligent uh, lady and uh, about the incident in Philadelphia. Apparently it's going around that the, the gentleman had a, a butter knife. 
but these people have one to four seconds to react in a life or death situation and shooting them in the leg is not an option. And by the way, that was a quote by the individual, uh, adrenaline uh, fueled responses. But uh, I like your interaction with the mental health because at that point, the mental health system broke down in our, in, in that community and, and, and a very close proximity uh, at Mr. Asagi's unfortunate incident, which I firmly believe was not racially motivated. And the last thing is uh, independent. Define that word independent. Um, if you listen to the 320 group, it's independent from all lawmakers. Well, that would make uh, the uh, American Bar Association, the uh, NTSB, and the American Medical Association irrelevant because after all, that's doctors, lawyers, and pilots uh, critiquing their own. I would rather see independent actually outside of our community so it's not biased by any potential community uh, influence. And that's four minutes, folks. Thank you for your for my time. Well, Chris, thank you for your comments. And, and we have heard um, similar comments regarding education and funding and transparency and independence. So uh, appreciate your, your comments. We'll add those to uh, what we've received. <clears throat> Melanie? Hi, my name is Melanie Morrison. Um, I live in Milheim, but I am the secretary of the 320 Coalition. Um, and I hadn't planned to speak tonight, but now I feel as though I must speak um, as, you know, speaking about using the police budget to um, fund this or pay for it. When we look at the State College Police Department's budget, they get 40% of the State College Borough's money. So it's not preposterous to want to reallocate some of that funding to put into this community oversight board, which is very necessary because we are talking about a very real situation in our community where you have people of color who are afraid to call the police because Osaze was shot three times in the back. And the insinuation that the police shouldn't have to provide that funding is just um, unnecessary as well as speaking about calling it defunding or reallocating, that's besides the point. Uh, the, the main issue here is that the police budget is bloated and we need to reallocate that funding where it needs to go. So whether people agree or don't agree about uh, police reform versus mental health reform. We're working in all of these channels um, simultaneously. And this is a very important aspect of bringing trust between the community and the police who are in our community, policing communities of color. It is very important that we um, are honest about this and um, Transparency is a very important part of that. Transparency needs to be forced in this situation because none of those investigations were independent. And when we're talking about police policing themselves, we have to make sure that this community oversight board allows the community to come in, allows that aspect of that forcing of transparency and so maybe some people in the community are not going to appreciate that, but it is very important. We need accountability and we need transparency. And this uh, community oversight board must provide that if it is going to function in the way that it needs to function to bring peace to our community and to uh, serve in the way that it needs to serve so that communities feel heard and safe and advocated for. Thank you. Thank you. Raymond. Uh, hi, it's actually Jean Najar. My husband and I are watching together okay. um, and I wasn't planning to speak. So I, I, and I will try not to ramble on. Um, I would say that I agree with everything that um, the young woman who just spoke just said, I would say that, um, you know, the state 
State College, we've seen riots <laughs> with students. I mean, when the Sandusky stuff went down, there were people in the streets and no one got shot. And so the idea that, <clears throat> that Osazi had to be shot um, in the back is just ridiculous. And people have been trying to reform police departments for like a century now. It's not a new issue. <laughs> And we have failed many times. We just, and it's like a cycle. You know, you, you set up a committee and you do this and, and the same shit happens over and over again. So it's time to rethink the police. And that means reallocating those funds because 40% of our budget for guys with guns is not necessary in our community. We had to call an ambulance for my daughter this summer and a police officer showed up. And I was kind of like, why is the policeman here? And he's asking me permission to come into my house ahead of the ambulance. And I'm thinking, well, I guess so. You know, I just want my daughter to get to the hospital. I don't think we need to pay the police to, you know, come before the ambulance. Okay. And the next time that happens, I will ask him to leave his gun in the car because I don't want a gun in my house. So I want this committee to stand up. And, and I don't want it to just sort of, <laughs> you know, the status quo is not enough. We have to make some changes. I mean, the riots in Philadelphia this week, I mean, this stuff just keeps happening over and over again. So let's do something different. Let's not, you know, I, I'm sure the police officers are all very nice, but, you know, they have their biases, whether they want to accept, you know, acknowledge them or not. And it's time to sort of, you know, help them understand what their biases are. That, that's all, thanks. Thank you. Jeffrey Landers Nolan. Thank you. Um, I'm also a member of the 320 Coalition and I, I apologize, I joined a little bit late. So only, I only caught the tail end of, of what you were saying, Mr. Potolivo. But I, I also feel the need to respond to some of that um, because I, I think we're, we're talking about really important issues. And as other folks on the coalition are speaking up, I think you can hear the frustration um, in, in the possibility of doing some of the same things over again. Um, it's not going to be possible within my four minutes to kind of litigate the the argument or the really the fact that there is structural racism that has founded uh, the the structure of policing and the criminal justice system amongst other systems writ large in our country but what I will say is that we know based on lots of really valid statistical research and many studies by uh, papers like the Washington Post amongst others, that tell us that police do not kill white people and white men in particular at nearly the same proportionality that they do black men or people with disabilities. And especially when a black person is someone with a disability, we know that that's fact based on, on just numbers there. And when we think about how do we correct it, we have to start by acknowledging that the problem exists, that there is disproportionality in police violence Whatever the causes are, we have to acknowledge that it exists first. One component of changing that, of reducing that, is making sure that there is accountability. And in terms of ensuring accountability, when we talk about transparency, yes, the, the public should be educated on what different facets of the criminal justice system do. But we're not talking about an equal relationship in terms of power dynamics. The police are a public service. They're supposed to serve the public and they're paid for by tax dollars. They are also a body with the power to use lethal force if deemed necessary to arrest people, to charge them with crimes. The public, on the other hand, is in many ways more vulnerable because of that. So when we talk about transparency, we have to look at it through the lens of who holds the power already. The police do at this point, particularly when it be, when it be when it comes to violence against people of color, because by and large, they're not held accountable. So in terms of transparency, there needs to be movement more and movement first on the police side. I think in addition, it's not accurate to say that we as a coalition want independence from all government and public structures for this body that would be completely ineffectual. 
what we want is independence in the sense that the criminal justice system regularly investigates itself and then declares itself absolved of wrongdoing. That's the problem that we're trying to uh, recommend that this body avoid. So independence in the sense of it absolutely needs to include members from this community who are most impacted by policing. We want people who are going to be fair, absolutely. But if we have members of a community who are not part of the community being policed, then we have a situation where people who are not impacted and have maybe not maybe little understanding of what is happening in a particular community responsible for making sure that what's occurring in terms of investigations is proper, is independent, and is fair. And that's a, a, an issue that I, I'm hoping that the oversight board will, will solve. Uh, the timer stopped, but I'm but I'm assuming my four minutes are up. So thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I was muted. Robert Ziegler, you can unmute now. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. loud and clear. Okay. Uh, you know, I, uh, my name is Robert Ziegler. I live out in Milheim. I'm actually a local elected official. Um, you know, I uh, recently, actually a little bit over a couple of months ago, there was an article on statecollege.com about a recent survey that was done with the police force in State College, where it said about one in four residents in State College didn't trust or have very little trust in the police force. And I believe 44% of the police force didn't believe they were being held accountable. Uh, for me, uh, you know, I view transparency as a big builder of trust. And it also creates a public accountability for public officials, as well as any public servant. Um, so in order to reestablish trust with the community, I really do think that transparency is, and accountability is a big key to that. Um, you know, and I, I, I see it in with uh, the local uh, officials and with state level officials and everything, you know, we're, we're supposed to be held to a higher standard. So the police should be held to a higher standard as well. And any standard that the police is held to should be higher than the regular citizen. If the regular citizen creates some sort of situation, their names would be released to the public, you know? So this is the same for the police. And, uh, you know, I really do think that's a key factor there. Uh, another uh, aspect that I think could help with accountability is that anytime that force is used, that the report has to be filed by the police force. This would therefore document if there's any sort of uh, issues or uh, repeat offender, so to speak, of someone who uses excessive force. It's a simple, low-cost way to help create accountability within the police department. Uh, I just wanted to reiterate that possibility as well. Uh, other than that, I don't have much input to give. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, let me just make a, a quick comment, um, just more to the panelists um, than, than anyone else, but uh, we're presently hearing from, from the public. I think after we go through this round, uh, what I'd like to do is, is provide an opportunity for any of the panelists to make, any of the members of the committee, to, to make any comments or responses they'd like to. And then if, if necessary, we'll, we'll do another round. But I uh, just want to make sure that people feel free to, to provide their comments. Uh, we receive those. And then I do want to make sure there's an opportunity for uh, committee members to, to make any kind of statement or comments or, or responses. And then we'll open it up to the public again. So Douglas, back to you. Uh, yes. And the other thing, uh, just to follow up with Mark, uh, Mark said, the chat is open and uh, you can also email us afterwards at engage at statecollegepa.us. If you have uh, articles, studies, data, information, please send a link so that the committee members can all uh, review those as well. All the information in the chat and that will be sent to email will be sent to all uh, committee members after the meeting. Carmine? Uh, thank you to the committee members for your work. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Uh, for those of the committee that may not know me, uh, my name is Carmine Prestia. I live at uh, 1265 Smithfield Street in the borough. Um, I was in, and uh, I have lived in the borough since I moved here. 
Uh, that's been in excess of 50 years ago. Uh, my wife and I chose to stay in the borough. We raised two sons here. I spent 25 years with the State College Police Department, a service of which I am quite proud. And uh, I spent 24 years as a magisterial district judge in the borough. Um, uh, there's a few comments I want to make based on some things I've already heard and some things I saw in the uh, document that was published. And I'm sorry, I haven't had the time to review all of them yet. Uh, the comment about why did the police come on a call for an ambulance uh, actually struck home with me. I was the first person in the State College Police Department to initiate first aid training for police officers. And State College Police officers have CPR and advanced uh, defibrillating device, external, uh, advanced external defibrillators. I believe they carry them in the cars now. Uh, in this particular case, the officer's presence probably didn't help anything, but in certain cases, it could have been life-saving. Uh, and they may have been able to get there faster in ambulance. Uh, the second thing I've commented about before, uh, I don't like the word oversight. The oversight group for the police department is the council of the borough of State College. They are the legal overseers of the police department and they should exercise that authority. A citizen's advisory board, I think is a wonderful idea and it should advise the council of what the citizens want. And it should be a way to take information in and do that. Um, the uh, third thing is many of the points relate to uh, certifications um, or policies and procedures. The department for a number of years has been nationally certified by CALEA. And uh, are we throwing out those certifications? That's a rigorous process. It costs a lot of taxpayer money to provide us with a much better police department. Um, and the uh, reports that were just mentioned, uh, I believe the department already has uh, policies and procedures that say that uh, if a weapon is discharged, a taser used, uh, anything like that, reports have to be filed for that or about that by the officers and supervisors involved. Uh, do we have to duplicate that? Or are we gonna do something else? Um, and the last thing only one person has mentioned, um, our officers are well paid, uh, they are well educated, they are highly trained. Uh, when I was a magisterial district judge, we were often frustrated by the fact that there was so much training that it interfered with court sessions. Uh, and lastly, I think this committee has to consider the morale of the police officers. They are our employees and we need to consider that. And I'll close by saying thank you for this opportunity. I appreciate it. Unfortunately, like many people, I have to go to another meeting tonight. Thank you all. Thank you, Judge, and thank you for your service. David Stone. Yeah, hi, my name is David Stone, 539 East Foster, and I wanna follow up on some more general comments I made last time. Uh, I, I had expressed some concerns that what we don't want is just another uh, advisory board or commission that's purely advisory, because I don't think that's gonna satisfy those in the community who have been critical of the current arrangements. I also recognize, and I, I noticed there are a couple of lawyers here on the, on the board, which is great, uh, there are legal problems, and I think uh, Mr. Prestia alluded to that, that ultimately council ha has the authority uh, to provide oversight, and it also has investigative authority in the charter. It also has the ability to do executive sessions on personnel matters and certain other things which are not going to go away. I mean, there is talk, okay, you know, we're limited by that, and therefore we're going to have a charter change and a referendum and all these ideas. Having been involved in a charter change years ago, it, it, it's not a sure thing. Uh, if that happens, we should forestall that. Uh, the better way is to use the existing system and then to build on that. What I suggest, and Nittany Valley Environmental Coalition and also the Moshannon Sierra Club have already endorsed the idea of a expanded public health department, in part to deal with the COVID crisis, but also to deal with other emerging public health issues and including environmental issues, since that, that is part of Act 315, for which funding is available. 
And certainly that health department would be dealing with mental health issues, substance abuse issues, uh, even, even violence, certain uh, low level violence, uh, bullying, uh, also sexual assault and things like that to take some of the burden off the shoulders of the police. And I think, I think having a unified uh, effort here uh, a health and safety uh, a board, independent insofar as it can be, but that will will take these matters directly to council, bypassing, if necessary, you know the normal borough staff bureaucracy, so that an important matter is it would get the ear of the council and the mayor directly, in a way like a public advocate, in a way uh, which which is occurs at the state level, public. Uh, 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 different different kinds of uh, roles, a consumer advocate, for example, and and then and then the idea would be using bringing together threads of authority, the public health authority, uh, even may emergency management authority, certainly the police authority, uh, and and I think this would be an opportunity for the, the police themselves to do something innovative. Many of them have tremendous talent and experience in psychology uh, training. I think it would be great to be part of a, of another sort of effort. And uh, rather than make it an oversight and some sort of a stigma, we're, we are looking at finding a way to do things better. And as a university town, I think we have to come up with a unique a solution for our university towns overall. And given that we have such tremendous talent in this town and expertise that can volunteer for something like this, that people can get behind. And, and I I'll finally say that a lot of the neighborhood issues and, and tourism issues, which is why we have so many police are perhaps best solved in a public health context. Uh, and I think the police had, had filled the gap because they were what we have. When we wanted the COVID regulations, uh, our group wanted uh, good, good COVID regulations. And, and it, it, you know, the police are the only ones there to do that in the short term. In the long term, we need a qualified Act 315 health department. I'd like to consider combining that, in fact, with this oversight effort and I think that would help everybody. There'd be enough to do that this board would be, you know, have a lot before it, which is good because if, if, if the things that come before it are rare, the authority withers away very quickly. So having a, a, a good portfolio to consider will help keep this board active. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate it. Farah Wiley. Hi, um, you can hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much um, for letting me speak. I just want to, so I just want to address um, some of the comments that have been mentioned before, but also kind of some of what we were talking about with the goals of the Civilian Oversight Board in general. Um, I want to start with the funding for the board. I personally see no issue with using police funding for the board. Um, the police in this city, along with most cities in the U.S., are completely overfunded. Um, police are doing way too much. They don't need to be doing this. Um, and I think that like, as we've been talking about a lot of reallocation, defunding, whatever you want to call it, the point is we should not be funding the police as much as we are. And people only get upset when we say defunding, but they don't seem to get upset when we say defunding education, defunding public health, defunding anything else. Um, so I think that we need to just focus on the point is that the police don't need to be funded as much as they are being funded currently. And I think that it's more than reasonable to expect this civilian oversight board to be funded with police funding um, because it's also addressing some issues that are caused by the police. So of course it should be, it should be funded with police funding. Um, also, I think that all of this reform or defunding, whatever, it's about shrinking the role of the police. It's not about connecting more to the community or making more of an effort to connect to the community. Um, I also think that the Civilian Oversight Board needs to be completely independent. I'm just going to echo that. I know a lot of people have said it before, um, completely independent from the police. I think there are plenty of independent citizens who are not connected to the police, but who are qualified just by nature of being citizens who have inter interactions with the police. Um, and I see really no reason for them to have any connection um, with the police. Um, especially um, as someone earlier was saying, I think Jeffrey, that um, it doesn't really make sense for us to continue the pattern of having the people within the criminal justice system evaluating and investigating themselves. Obviously, they're, they have a significant bias. I also, I just want to say the Civilian Oversight Board needs to have an ability to enact real change, whether that be through policy changes or sanctions. Um, I don't think it should just be an advisory board. 
it should definitely have actual power. The police are meant to protect citizens. And if they're not doing that, they should be held accountable by the citizens they're supposed to be protected. And specifically, they should be held accountable by the citizens who are most impacted by policing, which is people of color, especially black people in the US, because they have a higher, um, higher than average interactions with the police. Meanwhile, the borough council is mostly, if not all white, and they're mostly older. And I don't see how that would be how considering the oversight for the policing to be just the borough council, how that would be productive or really reflect the actual issues in the police system. Um, with that being said, I think that progress can't be made unless we acknowledge the racist nature of policing and systemic, the systemic racism prevalent in our country in, in every field really, but especially right now in law enforcement and the criminal justice system. The killing of Osaze Osagi did not happen in a vacuum. It's one of many killings of black citizens, specifically black and disabled citizens um, at the hands of the police. It is definitely connected to the recent murder of Walter Wallace Jr. in Philadelphia. And I think because of that, I think that the Civilian Oversight Board should make an effort to have significant representation of people of color, especially black people um, and people with disabilities because these people are disproportionately harmed by the police and they're disproportionately coming into contact with the police. Also, I know I'm running out of time, but versus um, talking about when the police are showing up or not showing up, I don't really understand why the police need to be showing up for ambulance calls or anything. It's great that they're trained, but why are we putting more funding into the police to train them for situations that they really don't need to be doing? I would much rather have a much better funded public health system like the man before me just said and have EMTs be able to show up right away before the ambulance. I don't want a police to come and and I'm a white person. And if I wasn't white, I can't imagine. Like people of color have been telling us for so long that they're uncomfortable with the police because of how the police have acted with people of color. And I think that we need to listen to that. And I think we need to acknowledge that a lot of people aren't comfortable with the police. And so we need to move some of the funding to public health departments and just listen to their cries for defunding the police instead of simple reform, which has been tried and failed for decades. I'm pretty sure I'm beyond out of time, but um, thank you for listening. Um, yeah. Thank yeah, thank you. I, I think our, our clock is not working very well, but uh, thank you. That was. I, th I think my I think my I had a uh, bad internet connection there for a second. So okay. I think, it, I think uh, the internet uh, paused us there. So thank you, Sarah, for holding yourself accountable. <laughs> we have a great clock. We have spotty internet. <laughs> yeah. uh, Joseph. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? We can. Excellent. Thank you for letting me speak tonight. Um, a lot of thoughts in my head. I'll, I'll try to keep it coherent. Um, and thank you for everybody else who's spoken so far, uh, especially Sarah. I thought that was particularly eloquent and well said. Um, on a few of the issues that have been we've been talking about, um, one concerning, you know, the oversight powers of the of the council of the borough council versus the you know should the civilian oversight board have any uh oversight powers um i mean one thing to consider is um well one is the political power of the police force itself and the police union and that is going to affect how the borough council um over like exerts its oversight power or not. Um, and two, even in a less nefarious uh, sense, I mean, the borough council may have, um, you know, you know, like, you know, positive relations with the police that aren't reflected uh, in this, you know, in the citizens of the, of State College, um, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it, it would be good and I would argue necessary to have a more independent body then do the um, investigating and conducting the oversight. In particular, in one of these earlier meetings, a gentleman, I forget his name, came on and said, you know, when the investigation was done internally by the police, uh, it came out that the investigation didn't interview anybody in the apartment uh, where Osaze Asagi was killed. And like, how can you call that a fair and thorough investigation when you didn't do that step? Uh, and so, uh, and so, you know, and I don't exactly know where, you know, how the borough council will get involved with that or not, but it would be nice to have then an independent body 
that could step in and say, you know, this investigation wasn't fair and thorough. Um, the other, the other kind of points we've been talking about defunding the police, reallocating the budget of the police and, and training and things like that. Um, I, I know I, I might sound like a broken record, but I, I brought this up several times. The police officers who responded to the Osazi Osagi uh, call, they, I believe they all had training in how to deal with a mental health crisis, um, which isn't to say that the mental health crisis training didn't have any effect, but in this particular case, it um, it didn't seem to have made a difference. Um, not to say it wouldn't make a case or wouldn't make a difference in all cases, um, but I think this is something we should consider. Um, you know, are police officers the best people to be responding to mental health crises? Um, are, you know, I, I was kind of looking also at some of the other things uh, somebody posted earlier about all the different trainings the, the police receive. I mean, also right school resource officers. I mean, right, there's a substantial empirical sort of research literature about this, about how police officers in schools disproportionately hurt students of color and it turns what otherwise would be normal discipline situations into situations where they get sent to jail. Um, and so I think part of this is considering the role police play, how much we put on them and reconsidering uh, what role we actually want them to play uh, and not just shove a bunch of trainings onto them and expect that this will sort of fix everything. And, and my time is up, but thank you. Thank you. Douglas, um, let, let's go to the um, old fashioned way of calling out when you get down to 30 seconds. I'll, and, and I'll share my screen now. I think your internet connection it, it hasn't gotten much better. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Douglas. And again, as, as I mentioned earlier, when we finish the first round, uh, I'll provide an opportunity for members to uh, talk but I did want to mention that I think both Shoba and Barbara have joined us. So maybe very briefly as we're transitioning, uh, Barbara, if you'd like to just introduce yourself quickly and then Shoba. They on mute. I believe- There you so. go, Barbara, I think you're on. <laughs> No, we can't hear you, I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry, Barbara, we can't hear you even though it looks like you're unmuted. Um, Shoba, could you introduce yourself and then we'll try Barbara again? Hi, are you able to hear me? We can, thank you. Okay, Welcome. Great. Hi, uh, my name is Shoba Siva Prasad Wadia. Uh, I have been a resident in Ferguson Township for the last 12 plus years. I'm a law professor and I focus on immigration and refugee law. Great, thank you. Hey, Barbara, you want to give it another shot? I sure can. There you go. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Thank Good you. evening, everyone. I'm Barbara Farmer, uh, live in Bolsburg, retired uh, administrator from the State College Area School District, worked at Penn State in uh, diversity, and now part of this uh, ad hoc committee. And I'm delighted to hear the comments and uh, glad to be here. Great, thank you, Barbara. Okay, Douglas, back to uh, first round. Rhoda. Hi, my name is Rhoda. I live in Bosberg. Um, I play a number of roles, but today I'm going to be speaking as a, a mother and a community member. And um, I moved to State College four years ago. And um, I just want to tell you about some of the stories of some of the Black mothers that I've met while living in this so-called Happy Valley. Um, let me start with the context. I've met a lot of people here that are not part of Penn State that <clears throat> are not part of the, I would say more elite group of, of the society that are here. And they are mothers. Many of them are low income. Many of them are single mothers. 
Um, many of them um, have faced various challenges from where they're coming from. They come from Philadelphia, they come from New York, they come from DC. I'm always astonished. And so I ask them, I always ask them, I ask them for their stories. And um, just, it's, it's really heartbreaking to hear, you know, people coming here to find a safe place to escape and to raise their children and to raise their black boys and their black girls in this country that has become increasingly hostile to all black children and all black people and trying to find a safe haven in state college and not finding that. I'm gonna tell you a few things that have happened in my community. Um, and I'm not going to mention any names to protect their identity. Uh, one of the mothers that I know um, has a problem, a domestic violence problem. And uh, we go over there, we knock on the door, we try to solve the problem as a community. And we, we don't call the cops. Um, I, 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 I reach out, I, I read about what I should do. And, I've spoke, and so finally I spoke to her one day and she was, ta she was telling me about another incident, which I'll tell you um, in a bit. And she said, you know, this is happening to me, but I can't call the cops. And I said, well, why can't you call the cops? She said, what if it's officer one? What if it's the officer that shot Osazi? And what, what's gonna happen? Do I want the father of, 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 of my children to be murdered in, in front of me because I called the cops? I have another mother um, that lives in the same neighborhood. She's been living here for 15 years. She has not, the children don't leave the house. And the reason that the children don't leave the house is because when the cops come to our neighborhood, bad things happen. And people are afraid that when the cops come, somebody's gonna get arrested, somebody's gonna get indicted. And so she leaves all her children at home. She has had various challenges with the school system and there's no help from anywhere to assist her. She's taken her issues all the way to Harrisburg. I have another mother that's also a friend. Um, her child was in the seventh grade. They moved here and in less than four months, she also went through a traumatic marriage, uh, uh, the death of her husband. And her child was arrested in the seventh grade. He was picked up, he was put on probation for an issue of anger, um, anger in, in, in the classroom. And he was, he was, he was taken away by, by the police, by the school resource officers, and he is on probation. Um, and many other children um, that live in the different low-income communities across State College are also on probation in special programs and all of this from encounters with the police. Um, I myself have wanted to call the police when there have been various incidents, but I don't. There was a fight between neighbors and we try as a community to solve these issues and these problems. And we actually created a community association to actually create a ways that ways that people can, can solve their problems without calling the police. But even after we created that community association, one of the members, ah, sorry, my time is up. 30 more seconds. 30 seconds. Okay, well, one of the members decided to call the cops on a 12 year old child last week uh, for taking the bike from one area of the community to the other area. And this was a white woman. And when we found her on her Facebook page, she posted and said, these are thugs. And I don't care if he's a 12 year old, he's a criminal. So these are some of the stories um, and some of the things that happen to, to mothers and children in these communities. And we don't need the police in our schools. We don't need the police in our neighborhoods. We want it to stop. We want the killings to stop. Someone talked about Philly and you just, just don't say it. Just don't say that. This man has, will not see his daughter be born. And you talk about it, that we should just keep quiet. We, don't, we want State College to be safe. The, the Osages came here too, for a safe place to raise their children. And many people come here. So we want you to help us to make this community safer and a safe haven for people to come and raise their black boys and their black girls and their Latino children and every child and all their children with disabilities. You need to help us regulate these police, change the funding structure. You need to help us in all these areas that you have outlined. You need a strong and diverse committee that really knows the problems of the communities. Many of these mothers will not come to your forum. I'm sorry, I'm taking a little more time. Many of these mothers cannot come. They don't feel eloquent enough to engage in these conversations. They do not feel that they can come to these high profile meetings. They, they don't think anyone is listening to them and they have given up and they have lost hope and they're just trying their best to make it and to survive even in this town. So please, for their own sake, let us, move these resources where they're needed in these communities to those that need it most and protect us from the police instead of the instead of us always being afraid of them thank you thank you
Ezra. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. Ezra Nains uh, from the State College Borough. The only reason why I'm here is to support and uh, amplify and be whatever kind of ally to uh, the voice of Rhoda, uh, who just spoke, um, and her neighbors and members of the community that she's referring to. Uh, there is a reason why we are on this call. There is a reason why there is a, a study committee for an ad hoc community oversight board. We need this. We have a problem. And, you know, it's, it's what we see in trying to address it is that there are many people in our community, and you see it across the nation, who feel a very deep desire to defend the police. And that defense, that instinct, makes it very hard to move these things forward, but we must move this forward. The, uh, the COB has to be an organ of the borough council, and the council does have the power to create this committee or this board, and it does have the power to invest it with, uh, with certain powers, but we need this, and it needs to have enough power to actually uh, bring about a certain kind of change, the change that we need so that what Ms. Nassiger said can be addressed, because it's not being addressed currently. So, um, I, you know, I, I, I've echoed this before, but it's this, the COB is an agent of transformation. And it's, only, it's an agent of restoring trust in the community, all of the community. If there's any percentage of our community that does not trust the police to protect them and have their best interests at the forefront of their every action, then we are, then we are failing to oversee it properly. Um, one of the elements I think is going to be crucial in, in creating this board is, is the composition of the board. And I would like to ask the study committee what your thinking is, what you've learned or about how you select a board that is diverse and representative of the community and gives actual power to members of the community that are feeling threatened by this, because we need that. We can't just put a bunch of folks who think everything is great on the board. And I, I know that people seeking membership will be people who wanna see change happen. So I'd like to ask the the committee for their uh, their input on that. And I, I thank you for the work you're doing. It's very important. And uh, I'm very grateful for uh, all of the efforts and of everybody who's spoken on this call. Uh, thank you. Um, members will have a chance to talk a little bit later, but uh, some of the details of membership in that, we've certainly talked about the, the concerns that have been raised by the public about diversity and impact of communities and others, but we have not made any decisions yet. And, and I'll allow every every member to, to speak to that issue if they like to when we uh, when we make comments. Um, so Douglas, back to any other first round comments. I do not see it. Oh, never mind. Theodore. Good evening, and thank you uh, to the members of the study committee for all the time uh, and the energy that you've dedicated um, to advancing. Uh, the manifestation of an oversight uh, board within the community. Um, a few of the limitations that often come up in developing an oversight board and implementing it um, have been addressed, namely independent investigative authority, uh, adequate resources. Uh, another one is that they often take a reactive rather than a proactive approach uh, to working with various stakeholders in the community. And I was particularly glad to see in the document uh, that was circulated the scope uh, of responsibilities uh, that you are thinking about uh, for this board. Um, and that it does in fact take a proactive uh, approach, which I think will be crucial to its success. Um, to help prevent incidents and to build positive relations rather than reacting to them when they've occurred. So thank you. Thank you. Douglas? I'm not seeing any additional hands up at the moment. Okay, uh, let me provide an opportunity for um, board members um, and Douglas, feel free to um, to call on a board member if, uh, if anyone would like to make a comment, just uh, raise your hand and Douglas can call on you. 
I'm not seeing any hands from board members as well. Okay, fine. Um, with that, um, we'll we'll take an opportunity to hear from any other individuals. Um, uh, this would be pretty limited for any kind of follow up um, comments. Uh, no need to do it, but um, but if anyone uh, wishes to make some uh, brief follow up comment, uh, this would be your opportunity. And if anyone was a little shy the first time around and wants to go a first time. Uh, this would be your opportunity as well. Melanie? Hi, um, I just wanted to add, when I spoke, I was just kind of super passionate. Um, and I know that I've, I've spoken on a few of these meetings now. Um, I just want to emphasize how thankful I am to have all of you on here, um, listening to the community, uh, doing all of this research, it is so important um, and it doesn't go unnoticed and we in the community appreciate you. Um, I know that you're not in an easy position um, and I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. David. Okay, can you hear me now? We can. Okay, yeah, I just want to clarify stuff. So, so it, it, I really am concerned that we, you take the opportunity to move past the abstract and the sort of general into the very specific, something that'll go before council and have the best chance of creating a board that has the authority and yet still falls within the limitations of, 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 of the current law. And, and I, I think that work should be done up front rather than you know, come to council with just another ABC, what looks like another advisory board and commission. Um, you know, the, the, the subtleties of how uh, the investigative powers of the council can be transferred to this board. You know, there, there are legal questions, serious legal questions. Uh, there are obviously questions with police contracts and so forth. I, I just generally believe though, that if we can come up with the way that this is not a polarized decision, but is one that, that, that meets all the requirements of the community at the same time, preserves the legal rights and, and that, that, that of contracts of the police and so forth. I, I still think one of the best opportunities to do that is to take this out of, make the context bigger and bring in other elements of the community that have concerns, uh, health and safety, and regard a lot of these as health and safety issues, and then try to find funding you know, for a doctor, for a nurse, to be involved uh, and, and, and so forth. And, and perhaps a, a dedicated task force within an expanded health department. Uh, we, we are finding that health departments, emergency management, they have all kinds of threads of authority that I think are very closely linked to what we're trying to do here. So I'm really hoping other people will be interested in how we come up with something that is not purely advisory and yet is still consistent with our charter, with, with, with the Municipal Planning Code, and with all the other things that those of us who have been observing government for the last several years have seen come up as problems again and again. And thanks. Uh, thank you. And just a, a brief response to that. Uh, one of the reasons the committee asked for the extension and received the extension was, I think, exactly the point that you raised. Um, we appreciate that we have to move from abstract to specific. And we also appreciate that we're a study committee and we have to create a framework that is, is broad enough but um, addresses specific concerns that there's the uh, authority given to a board to do what, uh, we, I, what we feel is, um, is asked from the, by the community. So, um, so I think your point's well taken in terms of we need to be specific and we need to do our due diligence to do that. And uh, that's why I, I'm, I appreciate that we received the additional time, but I can assure you that, that um, those are issues we've been concerned about from the start and, and we'll try to do that. And it is one of the reasons why we will have another public meeting. So in, I think it's in two weeks or so, we will, we will come back to the public with what we think is our sort of framework for moving forward. And then we'll have some time after that public meeting to do any kind of additional work before we present to council. So I think there's a, a really good opportunity um, to, to um, you know, to, to, keep, to check us, to, to make sure that we're um, meeting what, what you feel is necessary. And 
we have a lot of things that we're balancing and, and, um, and you know, we might not please everyone, but I think, you know, we're going to do our best and we'll bring something to the public before we take anything to borough council. But thank you. Mark, I am not seeing any additional hands up. All right, great. Um, any um, committee members want to make any uh, final comments? Jason? Uh, first, I just want to say thank you to everybody who shared their thoughts. Um, this is a forum where we need to take in all aspects and all perspectives here in the community. And we've got them today. Uh, we've had some very logical responses and some very emotional ones as well. Um, and it's super important that we all continue to push this conversation forward. So uh, I, I guess I just want to encourage everyone if, if something in this conversation has triggered a thought for you, if you have a perspective or if you have a voice that is not being heard today, please find a way to send, encourage them to email this email on the screen. Encourage them to reach out to us. Knowing and, and <laughs> I, 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 when it was said, there are people in this community who are not going to hop onto this forum to express their feelings because they are not able to do so, then I hope that some of us can help get their voice into our consideration as we move this thing forward. We don't have a lot of time. We're not gonna be able to accomplish everything here, but we need to at least hear the voices to make our best decision as we can. So again, I wanna say thank you to everyone who shared their thoughts and uh, we're gonna do our best to, to make this happen. And thank you for being here today. Thanks, Jason. Other um, other members? Mark? Yes, please, Janet. Yeah, hi. Um, I just, I wanted to um, give at least my perspective of why we're here. Um, and uh, I wanted to um, describe the process that the study committee is using, because it's not just what the um, community is telling us, but it's also the expertise of people who've been forming these community oversight boards all over the country um, and the feedback that we've been getting about what works and what doesn't work. And one of the pieces of feedback that has stuck with me is that when you have lost community trust in the police for whatever reason, um, that it's almost impossible to get it back without a community oversight board that the community oversight board is actually, is actually a mechanism for healing, moving forward and rebuilding that trust. Um, and it is, if you will, the hot um, new thing on the agenda. Um, and I think it's really important for State College to recognize that it's time to, get to move forward. Um, and that this is one of the best ways for State College to sort of take the next step um, in becoming the best kind of place that it is. So, um, so I think it's possible to um, uh, open up our eyes to the need for this kind of community oversight board um, and to, um, even if you're just a member of the community, do the research that um, helps us all to understand the ways that it can work in a constructive way for all of us. Thank you, Janet. Others? One of the things that I've, Barbara, one of the things I've been listening to, as I listen is a sense of wholeness, belongingness, and deserving to be a part of not just the community, but a part of being cared about and taken care of in the ways that most people or all people want to be taken care of. And as we continue our work, uh, some of the voices tonight and from the previous meeting uh, are ringing in my ears and I think ringing in our ears in terms of helping us to create this oversight. And someone else said that they didn't like the word oversight, but creating this situation of this board to be for all the people. And 
that's a gigantic task. But at the same time, because we care about the people that we are, have been created to take care of, it just drives us, I think, even harder to want to provide those resources for people to feel safe, for people to feel like they belong and that they are worthy. And that's, that's just making, our work, making us work harder and to create something that will take care of those things. And I thank people for sharing their thoughts. Thank you, Barbara. Anyone else? All right, I'm not seeing anything else. Douglas, am I missing anything? Are we good? You are not, Mark. I, uh, I, don't, I, think ever, I don't see any other hands up. All right, well, well once again, uh, on behalf of the uh, study committee, I wanna thank everyone for joining us this evening and for your comments. I remind you that uh, we'll be looking at all the chats that were submitted and um, any other comments that are received. So Doug is um, placed on the screen, the uh, Engage State College PA uh, site that you can send comments to. Um, as I said at the start, we, um, we take very um, seriously the comments we receive. We've, we've reviewed them, we've discussed them. Uh, we'll have meetings, I think, weekly until, um, until we finish this project. And, and we will have one more public meeting where we will present at least our preliminary recommendation before completing it and submitting it to council. So you have an opportunity to provide us with, with information to help us as we work through this process. And, um, and we'll be back in touch in a couple of weeks to let you know uh, where things stand. Um, and with that, uh, thank you all for participating. Thanks for the committee members. And again, to the um, borough, thanks very much to Tom and Douglas and Lisa for all of your support as we've been working through this and in arranging these opportunities for community input. It's uh, been very helpful. Thank you. Have a nice evening.